Let's get started. Good morning. Today is Thursday, April 22nd, also known as Earth Day. And welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Multnomah County Commissioners. The health and safety of our community and staff members are at the forefront of our minds as we continue to navigate county business in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. In accordance with the declaration of emergency announced on March 11th, 2020, and extended by the Board of County Commissioners on December 17th, Today's meeting is being held virtually. To align with social distancing guidelines, some rules associated with Board of County Commissioner meetings will be temporarily altered. Please remember to mute your mic when you are not speaking. And before you present, make sure to unmute your mic and check to see that your camera is on. May I have a motion on the consent calendar? Some of second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of the consent calendar. Will the board clerk please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Kavori? Aye. The consent calendar is approved. Um. Opportunity for public comment on non agenda matters. This is a time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. When it is your turn to speak, I will call your name and unmute you. I'll set a timer for three minutes when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up by saying time, at which point, please wrap up your sentence. Uh, when you are done with your sentence, I will place you back on mute. Madam chair, we received 2 written submissions for public testimony and 2. Uh, submissions for oral public testimony, which have been shared with board members and staff. Today's um, first testimony is from Cheryl Carter. I do not see that she called in, so we'll move on to Jocelyn Clark, who also did not call in. Uh, so we will move on to um, R1, which has like a little recess thing. <clears throat> Is that your cue to me that I'm supposed yes. to say something? Yeah. Thank you. We will now recess as the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners and convene as the Multnomah County Budget Committee to approve the budget. Uh, R1, resolution approving the chair's proposed fiscal year 2022 budget for a submittal to the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds approval of R1. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, everyone. A little over a year ago, we watched and prepared as the COVID-19 pandemic escalated quickly from a far off news story into a direct threat to the health and safety of our own community. And in the years since, we have seen our community stretched to its limits by illness, by financial hardship, and by profound disruptions to our sense of stability. There isn't a day that goes by when I don't reflect on how much things have changed and how those changes have come on the backs of some of the steepest and most urgent challenges that Multnomah County has ever faced. But I think just as frequently about how the staff and programs of Multnomah County have revealed to our community who we are by showing up time and time again to address those challenges head on and to walk alongside community, community members during some of their darkest moments. I saw our Joint Office of Homeless Services leverage partnerships to spread our shelter beds across additional sites to make sure that our congregate sites could follow physical distancing guidelines, and then open up physically distanced motel shelters for people experiencing homelessness who are especially vulnerable to the virus. I saw our public health programs leverage the trust they've worked so hard to build with historically underserved communities and culturally specific agencies to ensure that critical information, resources, and assistance reached them, and to coordinate testing and vaccine clinics for people facing the highest barriers. I saw the county tap into and then grow our network of partners to make sure that every last dollar of rent assistance we had 
kept thousands of families from falling behind on their rent. And when we received funding that could be used as direct aid, I saw us establish dozens of partnerships with community based organizations to quickly distribute more than a million dollars to struggling families. There are so many more examples of how Multnomah County has been there for our community, but in every way that we do show up, the county responds to the needs of our community members in ways that reflect our values. We lead with race in order to serve people and populations who are disproportionately affected by inequities. We honor the experience, relationships, and resilience within communities of color through partnerships and creating solutions that deliver services in equitable and effective ways. We prioritize transparency, accountability, and constant improvement. And we strive to be a place where everyone who needs help can find it, where everyone shares equally an opportunity and where the most vulnerable are protected. Today, I'm sharing my executive budget to offer a blueprint for leaning even deeper into these values as we address the county's highest priorities in the wake of the pandemic. It does that by allocating resources to our public health infrastructure, which has never been more important to keeping our community safe, and to our core safety net services, the need for which has never been higher. And at the same time, this budget also looks beyond our most immediate needs. As we stand on the doorstep of our recovery from the pandemic, we have the choice and the responsibility to take the wounds, the lessons and the resilience that we've gathered during this painful season and use them to emerge as a stronger, more just and more equitable community. The pandemic laid bare the urgency of conf confronting the inequities and injustices that stay in our community. Now is the time to pursue solutions and systemic changes that can eliminate those disparities. So my executive budget lays the foundation for building up the kind of county that will serve our residents for decades to come by investing in the first stages of three voter approved ballot measures that carry the potential to change the lives of thousands of people and transform our community for the better. It also invests in strategies that will alter how we do our work to ensure that our services reach the community and meet their needs in more racially equitable ways. We are also supporting the work of addressing racial disparities in the communities we serve, as well as in our own organization. And thanks to careful planning and faster than expected recovery from the shutdown, our financial picture has stabilized compared to the tumult we faced last year during the budget process. But we still face a $2.5 million general fund hole, which was balanced through strategic reductions. That doesn't account for the nearly $120 million that the county spent over last year protecting our community's health, housing, and food security as part of our COVID response. Thankfully, the Biden administration passed the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, which for Multnomah County means a direct allocation of $78.8 million for this coming fiscal year and another $78.8 million in the next fiscal year. These stimulus funds may seem like a windfall, but the truth is that Multnomah County will have to be strategic and intentional with every last dollar to meet the breadth and depth of this community's needs. At $2.81 billion, this executive budget is by far the largest that has ever been proposed in the history of Multnomah County. But I know it's also the most forward thinking budget that has ever been submitted, built on my deep conviction that Multnomah County can be a transformative force for our community. I know that Multnomah County can and will continue to make great strides in the direction of justice, safety, and the holistic health of our entire community in the wake of a world changing pandemic and beyond. The driving force of the county's pandemic response has been our foundational public health programs that have worked to prevent disease and death in our community decades before COVID. The strategies behind this work, education, outreach, investigations and contact tracing, direct services, and even upstream interventions are the same tools we've leaned on to keep as healthy as possible from the virus this past year. And they will continue to be critical in order for us to emerge from the pandemic in a way that protects our health and builds health equity in the community. That's why I decided to hold the health officer programs and the public health division harmless from any general fund reductions. 
The events of last year showed us that we simply cannot cut from our life-saving public health work. Instead, I am allocating the lion's share of our first round of stimulus funds to bolster our ongoing public health emergency response, including $35.7 million for contact tracing, testing and vaccines, and isolation and quarantine resources. I'm also directing stimulus funds to augment the core services that we need to protect and uphold the well being of people in our direct care during the pandemic, particularly those in congregate settings like jail and juvenile detention. The budget also improves our preparation to transition into a world beyond COVID 19. I'm adding a senior level position with general fund dollars to increase capacity in our communicable disease services while leveraging rescue plan money to add even more staff capacity to this team. These additional positions will help us track, prevent, and manage outbreaks of the current and emerging infectious disease threats. During a year when so many community members were rocked by instability and loss, the county's safety net services are a lifeline to vulnerable individuals and families. This budget supports a number of programs with the stimulus that will help people remain stably housed once the state's eviction moratorium and repayment grace periods expire. This includes eviction moratorium supports, attorneys for people facing eviction, additional infrastructure to help us distribute federal rent assistance, and tenant rights peer support and coaching that is focused on households of color in East County. I'm also investing in the addition of two staff members to the county's domestic violence crisis response unit, which will allow the program to meet survivors quickly at all hours of the day, and most critically in the hours after midnight, when we know the most complex domestic violence calls occur. In a time of such trauma and unease, it's vital to ensure that the youth in our community have access to the resources and tools that help them feel stable, connected, and safe. Our Sun Community Schools program and partnerships are among our community's greatest assets, supporting children and families who are most in need. My budget maintains Sun's core programming, as well as its parent-child development services, which helps low-income and families of color prepare for their children for kindergarten. An enhanced Sun School Summer Program that will provide students with opportunities for academic enrichment and support this summer will be funded by stimulus funds, as will an expansion of family resource navigation services within our Sun sites. I've also committed to expanding several programs that work directly with youth who are at risk of or have experienced community violence. A new youth program coordinator for Bienestar will help young people who live in the Coley neighborhood rebuild connection and community in the wake of the pandemic. The expansion of our community healing initiative, which provides culturally appropriate support to black African American and Latinx youth on probation and their families to decrease youth violence will bring comprehensive services to additional communities of color to address the root causes of violence. The public safety investments in my budget reinforce Multnomah County's commitment to shifting our understanding of what makes a community safer by pursuing approaches that interrupt and break cycles of harm and address racial disparities in the criminal legal system. I'm expanding three programs, the Stabilization Treatment Program, the Mobile Behavioral Health Team, and the Addiction Benefits Coordination Team so that each can adapt their respective models of providing behavioral health services to become more accessible and culturally responsive to justice involved black and African American community members. The budget also invests new general fund dollars into a pilot expansion of the district attorney's conviction integrity unit that will help people re entering the community address challenges to establish stability posed by their convictions or outstanding fines and fees. Right now, our community is hurting from a surge in gun violence that has killed people, injured more, and traumatized communities and neighborhoods. So we're making $2.7 million of targeted investments with our stimulus funds to help reduce fact risk factors and build the resilience of communities who have been most impacted by this surge in community violence. The county will work to prevent violence by funding programs that support individuals already involved in the criminal justice system. 
the Department of Community Justice's Elevate program, which provides peer support and skill building for young men from the Latinx and African immigrant communities, and our successful HEAT program, which teaches a curriculum tailored for African American men involved in leaving the criminal justice system. We're also expanding strategies that address behavioral health needs and interrupt cycles of violence. The Gun Violence Behavioral Health Response Team provides mental health consultants and peers to work with gun and gang impacted youth and families. While the Addressing Trauma of Gun Violence program will utilize community health specialists to help families develop safety plans and provide trauma support. The ways in which Multnomah County makes a difference in the lives of our community members aren't limited to delivering crisis or safety net services. This budget also invests in approaches that build and sustain community resilience, interrupt generational cycles of poverty, and add valuable assets to our community. I'm designing stimulus dollars, I'm designating stimulus dollars to expand our public health community partnership and capacity building team. This translates into additional support for coalitions in the Asian, Pacific Islander, Latinx, and Black and African immigrant, immigrant communities, leveraging their strength, wisdom, and connections into a healthier, more resilient Multnomah County. I'm also supporting the creation of the Mother, Multnomah Mother's Trust pilot project, which will partner with 100 Black women-led families to provide immediate access to a basic monthly income and build connections to other community assets. This program truly offers a pathway to a more racially just and equitable economic recovery as we emerge from the pandemic. And this investment also continues the county's planning to develop a baby bonds pilot program. And the library's new tech mobile, or as I call it, the book mobile, will bring core Multnomah County library services, including books, technology and learning opportunities directly to neighborhoods that have limited access to the library's offerings. When I made historic investments in workforce equity two years ago, I knew that it wouldn't be or couldn't be a one time only investment. This year's budget maintains and in some places increases resources and staffing focused on equity so that Multnomah County can continue to advance our workforce equity strategic plan and our efforts to foster safety, trust and belonging for all of our employees. I preserve funding for the complaints investigation and civil rights policy units and added additional support for equity work within central human resources and in our departments. My executive budget also includes reallocated new and expanded staffing to support more robust equity efforts in the health department, the Department of County Human Services, the Joint Office of Homeless Services, the Sheriff's Office, and our libraries. In the 11 years since the Office of Diversity and Equity was created, the county's needs have shifted dramatically. This budget supports an updated focus and structure to the office in order to put it in a better position to lead equity efforts within our organization. And this budget also includes increased funding for the addition of at least 20 new college to county internship opportunities. Last year, amid the pandemic, Multnomah County asked the community to support three ballot measures, each designed to help address a present day need while also harnessing the potential to transform our future. And the voters responded with resounding support. This budget allocates $52 million from the first year of the supportive housing services measure to invest in a suite of new programs that will end people's homelessness in our community. In collaboration with other county departments and our community partners, these programs will create new homes by providing deep rent subsidies, behavioral health services, and a more robust shelter capacity and street outreach that will quickly connect people to housing. All strategies that we know are effective at helping people get into and stay in housing. Guided by a lo community driven local implementation plan, the joint office is ready to put those funds to work immediately. In just this first year alone, we plan to create as many as 1300 new homes for people experiencing homelessness with the critical support services that people need. And we also plan to help an additional 1,000 households who are on the precipice of homelessness to keep the housing that they already have. 
This isn't just a long-term solution. This is an emergency solution. By voting yes on the supportive housing services measure, our community signaled their fundamental understanding that housing solves homelessness. There's no denying just how great the need is right now. One look at the tents on our streets, our neighbors sleeping in doorways and in encampments shows us that what's at stake now as we build a system that can finally begin catching up to the level of unmet need that we've faced for years. And thanks to the voters, we're finally about to do that. Multnomah County voters also passed the Preschool for All measure, which is poised to be one of the most effective and sustainable ways that our community can address the disproportionate and generational harms of systemic racism and economic inequality. Offering free, high quality and accessible preschool and childcare greatly expands a child's future prospects, but it also benefits parents and more frequently women, communities, employers, and neither, nearly every sector of the economy. This budget allocates $60 million as our initial investment in the Preschool for All program intended to help us build a strong and equitable foundation to get this visionary program off the ground. The funding will support the development of an accessible online application process, professional development for educators, and the creation of pathways that will allow culturally and linguistically diverse in-home providers to participate in the county's preschool program. The budget also supports the build out of a brand new preschool and early learning division within the Department of County Human Services. And finally, the $387 million library capital bond will balance library spaces and library services throughout expansions and modernizations in order to create a library system that serves county residents, residents equitably. Currently, the lack of library space particularly impacts East County, where 20% of our total library space serves 40% of the county's population. Every neighborhood library will be improved in some way through projects funded by this bond, including a new flagship library for East County. The Multnomah County Library System is undeniably one of our most treasured assets. These investments will ensure that it will continue to bring our community opportunities to learn, connect, and explore for decades to come. Even with the beginning of the end of the pandemic in sight, our community and our organization face a long road ahead. The work of addressing the deep harms that the pandemic has caused will take years. So will the work of recovering in a way that builds something better, more equitable, and more just than before. We've all seen how capable Multnomah County is in responding to big challenges, and I have never been more hopeful about what this community and this organization can become. I want to extend my gratitude to the community budget advisory committees for their work overseeing the budget process and for the time they spent with each county department to evaluate our programs and outcomes. I want to thank commissioners Sharon Myron, Sushila Jayapal, Jessica Vega Peterson, and Lori Stegman for their leadership and collaboration, as well as their dedication to serving the people of Multnomah County, which has shown through this last year in particular. I'm exceedingly grateful for my Chief of Staff, Kimberly Melton, whose tenacity and unwavering commitment to excellence makes Multnomah County a better place. And I'm so thankful for my fantastic team, Liz Smith-Curry, Adam Rennan, Anna Marie Allen, Liam Frost, Nicole Buchanan, Raphael Tamarki, Paul Park, Allison Conkling, and David Carey. This budget would have been impossible to navigate without the expertise and insights of our budget director, Christian Elkin, and our county economist, Jeff Renfro, as well as the rest of the central budget office. Thank you. And I'm grateful to our chief financial officer, Eric Ariano, who's been instrumental in laying the foundation for the success of the three ballot measures and has also helped the county navigate the deals of federal funding across two presidential administrations. And I also want to share my deep gratitude to the 6,000 employees of Multnomah County. As much as the last year has been shaped by challenges, it has also been defined by your dedication to supporting one another and showing up for our community. 
Thank you for your daily commitment to being a part of work that truly matters. Christian, you're up. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair. I'm Christian Elkin, the Budget Director from Multnomah County. I use she, her pronouns. You have before you a resolution to approve the fiscal year 2022 budget and direct my budget office to submit it to the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission, also known as TSCC, by May 15th. Approval of the proposed budget accomplishes two important steps in the budget process. First, it ensures that we will meet the legal and technical requirements of Oregon budget law to transmit the approved budget to TSCC. And second, it allows the board to begin the public deliberation process on the budget. A few good reminders about the budget process. After the budget has been approved, no fund can be increased by more than 10% without a special hearing from TSCC and no property tax estimate can be increased. Lastly, I want to highlight that approval of this budget does not imply or suggest agreement on the part of the board with the policies or the proposed resource allocations in the budget. The action today simply allows the county to meet the technical requirements of Oregon budget law and begin public deliberations. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Chair. All right, I'm gonna call on commissioners by district to see if um, people have questions or comments. Commissioner Myron. Wow. <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, Chair. Um, that that is uh, really powerful and and speaks to the moment. Um, I want to thank I want to thank you and your team for for your hard work on the budget. Um, and I really appreciate you, the chair's uh, commitment um, to so many of our priorities, including housing and public health and um, violence prevention. And I mean, just just so much. Um, I believe this is a very, very strong starting point for our deliberation over the coming weeks. Um, we know that these decisions are not easy and our budget process and decisions this year um, are exceedingly complex as we continue to respond to the pandemic and move to implement major new investments in housing and homeless services. Our budget process this year feels like an intricate puzzle, like a three dimensional puzzle uh, that has multiple right ways to fit together and then fit together in different dimensions. And um, I look forward to this process. Um, adopting a budget is the crux of our responsibility as a board. Um, I've, you know, heard said, and I would agree that um, our, our a budget is a, it is a moral document. Um, this is what exemplifies our priorities. And as a commissioner, it is a responsibility that I take very seriously. Uh, as I go through the process, I will seek to prioritize investments that ensure we're using our resources equitably and to help the most vulnerable members of our community in the most effective ways possible. And as always, I will be asking questions about performance measures to understand which programs are truly the most effective and efficient. Essentially what all people, well, all families do with their budgets. Are, are we getting what we pay for? Are these the right things to be investing in at this time? Whether we face a cuts oriented budget environment or a scenario with unconventional one time resources a, a year into a global pandemic, um, for opportunities to invest in programs and services that work at multiple intersections of the county's work, multiplying our impact to make a real difference. Thank you again to the chair um, and her team, to Christian Elkin and your entire stellar team, uh, to uh, um, to all Noma County who have uh, worked in this process, also the CBACs who do such uh, incredible work, and I look forward to getting started next week. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, thank you so much for putting together such a um, such an important um, budget and one that really um, captures uh, the the values and the intentions of Multnomah County moving forward. I when I think of where we were a year ago and considering the last budget, we were in a place that was completely unknown ter territory for so much of us. And I don't think any of us thought that as we were getting ready to um, start the, the public board process for this year's budget, that we would still be in this virtual world. Um, but here we are. And um, I know that we're starting the board work on the budget now, but I also know that so many people at the county have been working to get the budget ready to this point for many months. And I wanted to send my thanks and gratitude to um, your team, um, Chair Kafori, including Kim Melton, um, uh, Christian, to your team who've been doing such a fabulous job, to, um, to our CFO, um, to Jeff Renfo, for um, all of the folks that have been, and, and our CFO, Eric, and, um, and who have been doing work getting the revenue um, forecast ready so that we could have this budget in place. Um, and everybody in the departments who has been working hard for months to get us there, to get us where we are today. I think that as we look at the investments that we will be making in the next year, we are in a state, we are in a point where um, we have an unusual budget in that we have um, incredible opportunities to invest in areas um, that the vote voters told us to, including preschool for all, including the um, housing supports measure and including the incredible investments in our library system. And it's wonderful to have the opportunity to make those investments, investments that we know are going to pay benefits for our communities um, for, for years and decades to come. Um, and we also know that we are having to balance our current, um, our current revenue, revenues um, with the federal and state monies that we'll be getting um, as we continue to work on our response to COVID and the incredible needs in our community, especially in our black, indigenous, and people of color communities who have been impacted by um, COVID so much. And um, I'm grateful to see um, some of the new investments and, and ways that we are really making sure that we are targeting those. Um, the Multnomah Mothers Trust project is something that I'm very excited to hear about. And um, as well as the continued work that is so vital in light of um, what's happened in the last year, but also because of the commitment and the values of Multnomah County for dismantling systemic racism and um, making the investments in our own workforce equity strategic plan, as well as the re-envisioning of public safety in our justice system. Um, that's work that we are all committed to. Um, all of these things, including additional investments um, in, our, um, in our community and community partners are things that are incredible strengths in this in this budget and really happy to see. As we move forward in the process as a, as a board and considering this, I'll be um, making sure that we are taking the, the um, public trust that is given to us by the investments that have been made and using those most effectively, um, as well as making sure that we are taking investments, making investments um, in programs that benefit our community members and again, uphold the values of, of equity, of financial stewardship and um, and change that people are asking for us. So thanks again for everyone who has worked to get us to this point. Um, I'm looking forward to engaging with this board in a really um, productive budget cycle. Thank you, Commissioner. How about Commissioner Stegman? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would echo everything that has been said. I think that this budget is very ambitious and very bold. And you know something about the saying, you know, go big or go home. Uh, I think it's a demonstration of, of our values. And it's easy to talk about values. It's a much more challenging issue to implement those through a budget process. So I'm, you know, some of the things that, that I was excited to hear and, and thank you, Chair, and to uh, everyone who continually recognizes the disparities that people in East County experience. And so for that, I am, eternally grateful uh, to have leadership that recognizes that, you know, through our, through our SEND systems, through our student-based healthcare centers, and um, more importantly to the specific issue around fair housing testing, um, we need to have a way to know, well, we know that there is discrimination, but we, we've not 
in measuring it. And until we can measure it, we really can't take the appropriate action. So I really appreciate that. And, you know, the investments in mental health and behavioral health. Uh, again, you know, we've talked as, as a community, as a region about mental health, but I don't see other jurisdictions doing uh, the incredible things that we are doing around having a behavioral health resource center located in downtown Portland. Uh, and then, you know, the, the ballot measures that all pass from, uh, you know, supportive housing to preschool for all. And then, of course, our beloved libraries. And again, I have to bring it back to East County and how grateful I am uh, that East County will have a flagship library uh, that that we are deserving of and uh, we'll just elevate and support so many people that simply do not have the resources that other people already have. So I too am looking forward to the budget process uh, and just collectively, uh, again, I can't be more proud of what, well, while we've had so many challenges, uh, I remind my staff every day when we come to work that we have the privilege of being in a position to actually make change in our community. And I think that the, the chair's budget and everyone who worked on it, and even those that didn't work on it because you all are executing every day in your job that you show up on what that budget is, uh, how grateful I am and how meaningful it is when so many people feel helpless, uh, and including myself, that we can at least bring to bear uh, our values to our community through our budget process. So uh, thank you, Chair, and everyone that was involved. I look forward uh, to going through this year's budget process. Thank you, Commissioners. Christian Elkin, will you walk us through the work sessions? Yes, uh, good morning, Christian Elkin, Budget Director. Um, we, I am excited to talk about the next six weeks of work sessions and virtual public hearings. Uh, week one will get us started with a financial overview, information from the community involvement committee and presentations from county management, county assets and community services. We'll also hear from the special districts and the office of diversity and equity and the complaints investigation unit. During week two, we'll hear from public safety and the joint office of homeless services. Uh, sprinkled in with that will be uh, presentations from our non D offices. Week three is dedicated to the health department and county human services. Week four will bring us an update on the general fund forecast. We'll hear from everyone's favorite, the library, and we'll get to meet with the tax supervising and conservation commission. Week five is focused on budget amendments, follow up work sessions for anything that the, that the board would like to get more detail on budget notes and board deliberation of the budget. If everything goes as planned, we will adopt the budget on June 3rd. I would like to also remind everyone who's listening that we have two virtual community budget hearings planned for May 5th and May 12th. Those are scheduled from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And I'd also like to remind everyone that today's hearing, the tax supervising hearing on May 19th, and the hearing for the budget adoption on June 3rd are all public hearings as well. There's more details on our budget website. If you'd like to find more information on our calendar, the process, uh, the budget process, or the steps that we're currently in, or any of the documentation supporting the, the budget, you can go to www.multco.us backslash budget. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Christian. And um, the board clerk will now take a roll call vote. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. And Chair Gafori. Aye. The resolution is adopted. And we will now recess as the Multnomah County Budget Committee and convene as the Multnomah County Library District Budget Committee. R2, resolution approving the Multnomah County Library District's proposed fiscal year 2022 budget for submittal to the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission. So moved. Second. <laughs> second. Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of 
R2. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Kafori, Commissioners. Thank you for having me here with you today. I'm Bailey Elke, Director of Libraries for Multnomah County. I'm joined here to I'm looking over as though he's here in my house. I'm joined here today. He's not in my house. I'm joined here today by Don Algayer, our Director of Operations. I'm here today to bring the fiscal year 2022 budget proposal for the Multnomah County Library District. After a difficult year, <laughs> I am excited today and optimistic about the work that will be made possible by the proposed library district budget. In the next fiscal year, Multnomah County Library will contribute to its community in new and meaningful ways as a collaborative force to support people and communities most deeply affected by COVID-19, systemic oppression, and marginalization. You all know the phrase, follow the money, not to worry. I'm no deep throat and there's no political intrigue here, but if you follow the money in this budget proposal, you'll see a continued and deeper commitment to centering race and providing services and support to those in our community facing the greatest barriers. This is the ninth annual library district budget since the adoption of measure 26143 in November 2012, which created the library district to fund library services with a permanent rate limited to $1.24 per $1,000 of assessed value. The FY22 library district budget proposes to levy a rate of $1.22 per $1,000 of assessed value. This is the same amount levied for FY21. This rate is lower than the original projections for library district funding. As proposed, this budget will generate adequate revenue to maintain appropriate service levels and bolster the fiscal health of, dis of the district as it works to meet the unprecedented needs of our community as it recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic. The district tax is expected to bring in $92.7 million combined with other revenues, fees, grants, and interest. The district's total revenues are projected at $94.9 million. Of that, of that amount, 94.9 million is budgeted for transfer to the county library fund. Based on the county's financial policy and budget office recommendations, 0.5 million is placed in contingency and 10% of the expected tax revenues, 9.4 million, is placed in the unappropriated fund balance as the district's reserve. No additional balance will be transferred into the Multnomah County Library District Capital Fund which will total $35.2 million. The library uh, is not included in the county general fund allocations, as you know. Building on a rich history and a legacy of community engagement and support, the library continues to reinvent itself as an institution. Now, more than ever, we are deeply committed to doing that work thoughtfully with equity at the center of our decision making. As we move through and eventually past the pandemic, this library will be on the front line of our community's recovery from a more daunting period than any of us have faced in our lifetimes. I thank you as always for your leadership, your engagement and your support. And now I'd like to turn it over to Don Algayer, who is not here in my house. Don? Thank you, Bailey. <laughs> Good morning. This will sound familiar to you. It is the same process you just completed for the county budget. We are asking you to approve the fiscal year 2022 library district proposed budget and to direct us to submit that document to the tax supervising and conservation commission in order to meet Oregon budget law requirements. It comes with the same caveats as with the county budget after the budget has been approved. The district may fund may not be increased by more than 10% and the property tax estimate cannot be increased. This budget will also be posted for public review. Thank you. <laughs> All right, over over to you, Chair Kafori. Thank you. Tasia, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair, <clears throat> we did not. 
All right, I'm going to call on commissioners for questions or comments. We will start with Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you, Don, and to all of our incredible library staff and employees. Uh, I'm just really excited uh, about what the future holds. It seems like uh, obviously we've had some major challenges, but it's just so exciting to see uh, the growth of the our library system on the horizon and the incredible things are, are going to be accomplished in the upcoming years. And I'm all in. I know this whole board's all in and it's just it's nice to be happy about something. Uh, so thank you for bringing uh, a bright spot to us today. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Bailey and Don, for um, introducing the budget. And um, I look forward to considering this, but it's really, um, as Commissioner Stegman said, it's really great to have something so positive and big to look forward to um, for the library system. Although I will note the, um, the levy rate of um, a dollar and twenty-two cents per thousand is getting pretty close to the top of that um, top of the allowed measure, and um, and so I know that's something that um, as we work on this budget will be something we'll be keeping in mind for future yeah. budget years. But in the meantime, it'll be great to work with you um, as we consider the budget um, proposals for the library and the wonderful investments that we're going to be able to make yeah. in this next year. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Myron. Um, I too, thank you, um, Bailey and Dawn and excuse me, <laughs> all, I'm just so choked up, um, <laughs> all, all who worked on this, um, this budget, I am really excited to delve into it. Um, and just so excited to see the growth and vision, um, both the physical growth of the, the locations, the infrastructure, and just the conceptual growth and vision uh, that we are looking forward to with our library system. Um, it has been a year, obviously, of challenge beyond measure. Mm -hmm. um, but within that, the silver lining sort of that we that we talk about and glom onto are those opportunities to the for the future and the things that we have learned from this process. And um, and this is such a crucial time, and I think it's perfect timing as we embark upon this this growth. Um, so. Thank you uh, for presenting the budget today and look forward to the process. Thank you, Commissioner. I am really thankful to the voters of Multnomah County for giving us this opportunity to, um, to, to think big, to dream, mm -hmm. and to be able to create a library system at new libraries and new services that really reflects who we are as a community because we know how much um, we love our libraries here and i i just am always surprised when i hear those startling statistics about the lack of library services and library physical library buildings in a part of the county that desperately needs it the most so i am really hopeful for the future i think that this um this budget that um, we will be discussing over the coming weeks for our libraries um is really, as Commissioner Stegman said, a, a really a bright spot for us all. So thank you. And before you leave, I will uh, carry on the tradition of our <laughs> colleague, Judy Shiprack. And I will ask you, I will inquire of Bailey Elke, Library Director, what good books have you read lately? I am just finishing up a really terrific novel. Um, it's a first uh, book. Suddenly I can't remember the author's name. <laughs> I'm like the world's worst librarian. But it's called The Final Revival of Opal and Nev. And I think I heard about it on NPR or something. And um, it's brilliant. And it's uh, it's it centers on a, a young woman whose uh, father was a very, very exceptional um, musician, a drummer, and in the 50s, 60s, and she grows up to be a reporter at a sort of a culture magazine and um, investigates this event, this, this uh, like a show, a musical extravaganza 
um, of this duo, Opal and Nev, at which her father was the drummer and some very um, uh, sad and strange things that happened at that event and everything that led up to it. And over the course of the book, I mean, you, you, I, you find yourself always thinking, is this a true story? Because she references all these people that we know, famous musicians, you know, fashion folks, writers. And um, so it's also a really great reflection on um, the history of, especially around um, black culture in this country in the 50s, 60s, 70s. So I would definitely recommend it. It definitely takes, a, it, it's one of those books where you get halfway through and you think, oh, it's about to end, but there's still half the book to go. I wonder what's going on. And then it just gets even better. So I would definitely recommend the final revival of Opal and Nev. And thanks to my amazing staff, Liz Smith Curry. The author's name is Donnie Walton. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. A-W-N-I-E. Yeah. All yeah. right. Thanks Good. That time. sounds fabulous. I'm going to be getting that book. All right. Tasia, our board clerk, will you please now take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Kafori? Aye. The resolution is adopted. We will now adjourn as the Multnomah County Library District Budget Committee and reconvene as the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. R3, budget, budget modification number JOHS-003-21, appropriating $2,479,903 in out of the cold wave one and wave two funds from the state of Oregon. So moved. Second. Second. Commissioner Vega-Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of R3. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Chair Kofori and Commissioners. Adam Brown here from the Joint Office of Homeless Services. I use he, him pronouns. First off, Chair, thank you so much for your leadership vision and commitment to equity uh, in your budget. You're in this leadership position at a unique period in time and you're clearly maximizing the opportunity to have a meaningful impact on our community, and we've heard that in your budget message, so thank you for that. Um, before I get started on the specifics of budget modification 003, I want to provide some overarching context for all three of the budget modifications I'm presenting here today. So these three budget modifications appropriate a total of $7 million in funding allocated by local and state partners to fund programming associated with the homeless services portion of the county's ongoing COVID-19 emergency response. As you know, over the course of the pandemic, largely starting with the CARES Act, funding has been made available to the county and to the joint office in waves. There's been sort of a fortunate sequence to this at certain points where we anticipate or identify a need, the funding becomes available, and we work hard and quickly to get that funding out to our community. And that's the case with the resources we're appropriating here today. As last summer went on and it became clear that the pandemic would have us facing a very difficult winter, the joint office began planning with system partners for the cold weather season. That work largely centered on expanding the things we do each and every winter to ensure adequate winter and severe weather shelter capacity, safety on the streets outreach to keep unsheltered members of our community safe, and expanded motel vouchering and placements out of shelter. We were doing that in the context of strained system capacity and the limitations COVID-19 has uh, presented around the safe provision of shelter and outreach services. Fortunately, parallel to this planning, key resources became available to fund winter season programming outside of what had already been made available for our core COVID-19 programming and on top of what we budget each and every year for the winter season. The budget actions before you today are us circling back and making the formal appropriation of these resources consistent with our budgetary requirements. So this first budget modification here, uh, Joint Office 00321, appropriates a total of 2.5 million in out of the cold funding from Oregon Housing Community Services. Early in the fall, in response to the intersecting emergencies communities were facing with COVID-19 and the wildfire response, 
OHCS made a first wave of out of the cold funds available to community action agencies from its emergency housing account. Multnomah County's allocation was approximately $500,000 and the joint office immediately allocated those funds to take its seasonal Walnut Park shelter from overnight only to 24 seven. Later in the fall, after a $10 million allocation from the e-board, OHCS made a second larger wave of funds available to community action agencies. Multnomah County's allocation was just under 2 million and the joint office used this funding to increase allocations to service providers for placements out of shelter, safety on the streets, outreach, and motel vouchering. Are there any questions about uh, budget modification 003 with this uh, OHCS out of the cold funding? Thank you, Adam. Uh, Tasia, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair, we did not. All right, well, I will see if we have questions or comments. Uh, Commissioner Myron. Uh, no questions or comments. Just thank you, Adam, for uh, that really excellent framing uh, of the situation and the context for uh, these budget modifications. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Adam. I just feel, um, I mean, this is so great that we did get these critical OHCS dollars to help fund um, um, the services in the shelter that kept people safe and sheltered and um, many people probably alive during the winter months um, by expanding our services. So this is really critical. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I'm glad that we were able to have uh, some flexibility in helping people in a time of need uh, and then getting reimbursed for it. So thank you. And then most importantly, at the end, thank you. All right, Adam, thank you so much. I know you're gonna stick around because you're also on R4, but we will have uh, the board clerk take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioners Vega Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. And Chair Kafori. Aye, the budget modification is approved. R4, budget modification number JOHS-005-21, appropriating 3.6 million of CARES Act Community Development Block Grant Funds, City of Portland. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds approval of R4. Welcome back. Thank you. Once again, Adam Brown here from the Joint Office of Homeless Services. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, so this second mod budget modification here before you appropriates $3.6 million in uh, CARES Act Community Development Block Grant funding from the City of Portland that was allocated for winter shelter. So again, as part of our winter weather planning, we identified a need to expand shelter access beyond what we might do in normal years. We were able to work with the city to make the Charles Jordan and Mount Scott Community Centers available over the winter, and we worked with our uh, partners in DCA uh, in facilities to lease and make suitable the Greyhound bus station downtown for use as a winter shelter. In total, these sites added 300 beds to our shelter system for the cold weather season. Tasia, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair, we did not. All right, commissioners, can, we'll start this time with Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Adam, again, and thank you, City of Portland. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Adam. And I just think this again shows like really the, the power of governments working well together on to find critical things. Commissioner Myron. Thank you, Adam, and ditto. And stick around, Adam. You got one more after this. Tasia, would you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Baker Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. R5, budget modification number JOHS 006 21, appropriating $925,327 in CARES Act Emergency Solutions grant funds from the state of Oregon. So moved. 
Second. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of R5. All right, last one here. Once again, Adam Brown from the Joint Office of Homeless Services. So this third budget modification appropriates $925,000 in CARES Act Emergency Solutions Grant funding from the state of Oregon. Uh, this funding came to us in two waves as part of how the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development allocated the CARES Act ESG resources. This funding will allow us to keep the Greyhound bus station shelter open beyond March, as was originally planned as part of the winter weather planning. And this shelter will now be open through September. Tasia, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair, we did not. All right, Commissioner Myron, questions or comments? I have uh, no questions or comments on this one. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Uh, thank you. No questions. Commissioner Stegman. No questions. Thank you, Adam, for all of your work. Um, I know that this has been a challenging year in many ways. And keeping track of all the dollars that come into the joint office is one of those things that has been challenging and you are doing a great job of it. So thank you. Thank you. Tasia, would you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. Thanks, Thank Adam. You. R6, proclaiming the week of April 18th through the 24th, 2021, as National Crime Victims Rights Week in Multnomah County, Oregon. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of R6. Who is kicking it off this morning? All right, that means I'm up. <laughs> All right, good morning. I'm Rhea Duma and I use she, her pronouns. I manage victim and survivor services at the Department of Community Justice. Chair Kafori and commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to come before you today in honor of Crime Victims Rights Week and for your ongoing commitment to support survivors, not only in Multnomah County, but throughout Oregon. This year, Crime Victims Rights Week focuses on supporting victims and survivors, building trust and engaging communities. While these themes have always been important, the last year has highlighted the critical need to help those experiencing the greatest harm, to restore confidence in our systems through meaningful action that not only recognizes the inherent racism and oppression built into our system, but works to transform it and to always center the most impacted. Let me remind us all, the one person forced into a relationship with the criminal justice system is the victim, yet it is often their needs and preferences that are the last thing to be considered, if they're even considered at all. Services for survivors are difficult to access and they're relatively scarce compared to the services that are invested in those who cause harm. This is true at the local, state, and national levels. For every dollar spent on incarceration in Oregon, the state invests about a penny on survivor services. Let that sink in. So while the barriers that survivors face as they navigate our systems are not new, this past year has had a uniquely painful impact on survivors in our community. The COVID-19 pandemic, the tragic murder of George Floyd, ongoing political unrest, natural disasters, and an unparalleled increase in gun violence in our community, unlike anything that we've seen in the past 30 years, have all contributed to countless new victims and devastating ripple effects on our families and communities. Each of these events have made it increasingly difficult for survivors to not only understand and access their rights, but to access services around their healing and trauma. The last year has exacerbated everything that isn't working, shining a bright light onto the ways our systems need to do more, to stretch and adapt in order to uphold the needs of people who've been hurt by crime. At Victim and Survivor Services, we took a hard look at our policies and practices, and we made a commitment to not only uphold crime victims' rights, but also to ensure that our work reflects our core values of equity, trauma-informed, and survivor-led. 
These values serve as a compass to determine if our services are helping or harming. They guide us by asking, are our policies and practices dismantling systems of oppression and transforming them to be safe, inclusive, and equitable for all people? Are we listening to and uplifting survivors' voices and trusting them as the experts in their own lives, knowing that it is our role to follow their lead? Are we minimizing complexity and removing barriers for trauma survivors as they engage with our systems? We grapple with these questions daily. They move us to action and they've resulted in significant improvements to our services. As a result, we repurpose funding and reorganize how our entire team operates. We added an advocate and two culturally specific caseloads to serve our Black, African American, and Latino, Latina, Latinx communities. And while advocacy services increased by 12%, we've still maintained a 98% 24-hour response rate to all new advocacy referrals. Our notification services now include a bilingual notification advocate who provides trauma-informed notification to survivors and critical advocacy services like safety planning, system navigation, and referrals. In light of the 60% increase in requests for the right to victim notification during FY20, this shift is far reaching. The right to victim notification is in many respects the most important of all rights because this right is the one that creates the possibility of engagement. Unless a victim is given the right to be informed of their rights, there's little chance they will exercise them. If a victim isn't given notice at the time and place of a sentencing hearing, there's little chance that they'll ever have the opportunity to exercise their right to attend and be heard at that hearing. And in cases of domestic violence and stalking, notification of an offender's release is more than a matter of interest. It can also be a matter of life and death. Lastly, with the support of the CARES Act, we were also able to expand our emergency fund to further support survivors of domestic violence to address immediate safety and basic needs. This was imperative as the pandemic has resulted in further isolation for this population and has increased multiple factors that contribute to domestic violence and higher lethality risk. So while Crime Victims Rights Week invites us to pause and to celebrate the progress of crime victims' rights, and we have so much to be proud of, we can't forget that we still have a long way forward. May Multnomah County be a leader in centering survivors in our responses to injustice and harm. May we be a leader in tipping the scale and thinking big about what is possible in our community. Thank you, commissioners, for supporting us in our work to provide the best services to people who did not choose us but who we believe should not be alone in navigating our systems in the aftermath of victimization. I will leave you with victim and survivor services vision, a county that is equitable, responsive, and resourced to meet the needs of those who have experienced harm while creating meaningful options to repair harm. We hope that everyone will join us to make this vision a reality. Thank you. And I'd like to pass it off to Emily Hyde, who is one of our fabulous partners in the DA's office. Thank you, Rhea, for the introduction. I would echo all of those same sentiments. Um, I am the supervisor for the Victim Assistance Program. Chair Kafori, commissioners, I'm honored to have the opportunity to join you this morning. I'm also joined virtually by victim advocates and employees from the District Attorney's Office and Department of Community Justice, as well as District Attorney Mike Schmidt, who will be reading the proclamation later this morning. So thank you for dedicating this time to Crime Victims' Rights Week. Victims' rights are still relatively new. Not many people understand the criminal justice process or their rights until they're a victim. When people think of the criminal justice system and rights, a number of rights afforded to defendants easily come to mind. Speedy trial, right to an attorney, but many of us would struggle to name any of the rights that victims are entitled to, which is why I'm so grateful for you and your efforts today to raise awareness of victims' rights. Victims after being harmed, oftentimes deeply impacted by trauma, struggle, struggle to understand for the first time what the criminal justice process means both generally and how it applies to their case, to their safety, to their lives, to their family and to their experience. We cannot unwind the harm that was caused, but we know that our response can frame their experience. It can help support healing, a sense of safety and justice and fairness. Our response can also negatively impact all of those things being believed, being informed, being treated respectfully and with dignity, 
is core to the work that we do. We cannot issue every case and we cannot always deliver justice through prosecution, but we can make every effort to support, inform, listen to, and explain. I want to share an experience that shaped my appreciation for how far we have come with victims' rights. It's unimaginable that victims could have could ever have had less rights than they do right now, or that their roles could have been diminished. Um, I was, I'm gonna kind of reflect back on this. It has a has an effect on me um, because it was really a moment when I realized how far we had come and and what I had taken for um, just for granted. Um, so I wish I could convey all of those feelings and you could feel them with me, but. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a situation where I was meeting with a victim um, in preparation for a parole board hearing. So it wasn't somebody that I knew. Um, the this hearing actually happened over a decade ago for me, and it really still um, is impactful. I knew it was going to be difficult. I sat with her and I listened not only about the murder of her husband that she witnessed, um, but also the ways that she had been assaulted and harmed so many years ago. Because at this point, it had been. I believe about 25 years or so. Um, so this is a considerable amount of time. Um, but really what stuck with me was what it meant to her in that moment um, after the conviction um, to have some of the rights that she wasn't afforded then. And that was really this moment where I had some additional perspective of what it meant to have victims rights now. And um, I'm gonna go through a little bit of that experience. She didn't have the right to be present in the courtroom. She waited, sitting through trial in the hallway, like any other witness, until it was her turn to testify. She didn't hear the details of the trial firsthand. She described the pain that the person had caused her and that that person had more rights in that moment than she did. She didn't have the right to address the court as sentencing, to tell them how this impacted her or what she wanted as a consequence. She was a victim and a witness and not until the parole board hearing did she have the rights that are afforded to every victim in her situation now? The palpable impact of what having those rights meant to her as I sat with a prosecutor explaining each one of them and the options for exercising them was a lesson for me and one that has stuck with me. We have not come far enough um, and we simply cannot trust and accept that the right things will happen for victims. We owe it to ourselves and to each other to keep forging forward for victims' rights. Although it should never happen, there are times where rights may not be fully upheld and they may be violated. The power to recognize that and to remedy these harms with victims is essential. The scales of justice are a powerful image. We must always work to ensure that the rights of victims are being held in fair balance throughout the entire criminal justice process. This includes the right to safety, to be informed, to be treated with dignity and respect. Each one of us here in our own roles rises to meet that challenge and support survivors. I wanna share my deep gratitude for everyone moving this work forward, supporting those who have been harmed. This includes victims' rights attorneys, prosecutors, law enforcement, advocates across the spectrum doing community and system-based work. The importance, impact, and value of hearing from and centering victims cannot be underscored enough. With that, I, we do have survivors who are here to share a little bit of their experience. So I am absolutely honored to introduce our first speaker, Rochelle, who will be sharing some of her experience. Rochelle, I'd like to pass it to you. Okay, so I got my camera on. Can we see the video? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, there, there you are. We hear you. Perfect. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rochelle Powell, and thank you, Chair Coffrey and Commissioners, for honoring crime victims' rights and the importance of their rights and the opportunity for me to share my story today. My story starts out like many others. My stepfather sexually abused my sister, three friends, and myself. He was sentenced to many Measure 11 charges and 16 years in prison. For these past 16 years, I have worked very hard to address my own trauma with lots of therapy and have become a voice for those who need it. I have gone to school for child development, criminology, social sciences, and taken more trainings than I can count on mental health awareness and trauma-informed practices. I have also been volunteering myself as a victim advocate for many years. The growth in crime victims' rights has come a long way from the Reagan era, where victims' voices were a mere echo behind the rights of criminals. 
Crime victims' rights have helped me immensely from notifications to mental health check-ins, and most importantly, updating me when there are developments in my case and connecting me to the restorative process. However, I was not told about the facilitated dialogue program. Had I known that there was a restorative justice program that provides survivors like me an opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with the person who harmed them and the ability to ask questions that we couldn't throughout the original criminal justice process, as just previously given an example. Questions that help survivors get answers that are critical to healing from trauma. I may be in a very different place right now. How could this have gone differently? Had I known about the facilitated dialogue program, I would have taken advantage of it while he was still in prison. And it's possible that he could have worked with the program and taken a route better suited for healing. Instead, he now stalks me and my family. He chooses to no longer take responsibility for the crimes that he has committed. And I'm here still feeling the same fear, knowing that my abuser is out there in the community. Had I known of this program, the opportunity to experience this facilitated process, would my family and I be constantly looking over our shoulders, fearful of every unknown caller, and be afraid of him accidentally showing up at one of our homes? Would he be stalking us if he had the opportunity, as well as me, to access this program before? I am only able to maintain my self-composure because I know the system. What options does everybody else have? The justice professionals that a victim interacts with throughout the system has an overwhelming power to shape their experience in the criminal justice process, their case and their mental health and healing. They also serve as a gatekeeper to whether or not the victim or, survi victim or survivor knows what rights and services that they have access to, how to access them and whether or not their rights are upheld. While restorative justice is not yet a victim right, it is one of many options available to survivors that can be a critical piece of healing on their journey. Unfortunately, it is often overlooked and survivors of crime don't know about it or have su the support to access it. It's decision makers like you who have the power to implement important programs and policies to ensure that victims feel safe and secure their interactions with the system and that they have agency to define what healing looks like for them. You have the ability to influence systemic change that ensures victims are not only aware of all of their rights, but programs and services to support their healing and trauma, like the facilitated dialogue program. I hope that you will use the knowledge you gain today to help strengthen the system and further protect victims of crime, both physically and mentally. Thank you for your time and what you do for victims of crime every day. And thank you for coming forward this morning, sharing your story. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, I really appreciate you being here and for sharing that. It is incredibly powerful and it is how change moves, it moves us forward. Um, next, we should have Tommy on the line as well, and he also will be sharing um, some of his experience. Tasia, do we have the next speaker on the on the call? I don't. Oh, maybe. This is. Let me see. Hold on. Sorry. Give me. A I see Tommy. Oh. Thank you, everybody. Good morning. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of victims. Um, I am a 58 year old male, Japanese American. Um, my parents, my grandparents were first generation from Japan. It has been my upbringing, upbringing to not really think of myself ever as a victim. Just uh, the Japanese were always strong, very silent type. And, um, you know, as many of you are aware, I mean, they they were interned during the World War II um, and nobody ever talked about it. They, you were never a victim. You just moved on, took 
what happened to you and um, got over it. Um, I was assaulted at um, at a Max station um, by a person who thought I was a Chinese American, and um, it was a person that uh, was not in the right mind of the state of mind. Um, I don't know if he was definitely the effects of alcohol and so i i tried to avoid him but he came up to me asked me if i was chinese and when i i had my earbuds in because i was listening to my music and when i pulled it out to listen to what he said he swung and hit me um it was you know not unprovoked there was i had no no way of knowing that he was going to strike me but um it was a glancing blow. I was able to see it coming and and it just brushed my face, but it still, you know, was an assault and it was a, a, a biased racial assault. So after the initial shock, I called the police. I called 911 and there was an officer, there was a, a police car close by, so they were able to capture him. Um, I spoke with the officers and they encouraged me to press charges because they said, and what really made me press the charges was they said, well, if you do not press charges, he, he will not be arrested. He will be out on the streets. And I knew he was a danger to society. Just the hate and the attack on me, the unprovoked attack could happen to anybody. So I pressed charges. When I pressed after that, I went home, the officer gave me their card and I, I looked up the person online, saw his previous arrest. He had been arrested like twice in the last six months and, um, multiple times before that many assault charges. And so I knew I, for, my first thought was why is someone like this on the street? And then, um, the DA's office contacted me. I really um, appreciated the DA's office. They kept me fully informed of all the, all the steps along the way. They uh, told me of my rights and they even consulted me about um, the plea bargain that was going to be offered. So I felt like a, a vital part all along the way, not just a case number. I felt like I was actually uh, a victim and that I actually counted for something. Um, I, I hold no animosity against my, my assailant. Um, I, I'd like to see him get the help that he needs. And that is why I pressed for a longer probation than they were asking. I felt that if he was in the system and being processed, you know, or being held accountable, that he would have to try and improve. Um, the victim, he agreed to uh, a restorative work with the uh, uh, Oregon Chinese Society, which I think will help. He had stated at the uh, at the plea trial that um, he really didn't hate Asian people, and you know. He had mental issues. He was evaluated and treated at the Oregon State Hospital. So while he had these mental issues and while he was you know, using substances and abusing, um, that hate was still there and it was seated. And, you know, I mean, I feel a lot of it was brought on by the pandemic and the blame of Chinese for the, for the virus. Um, but it's still, I've been a victim of bias and, and racial uh, discrimination my entire life. So that starts somewhere. And um, I am glad to see that things are being done now to address it. I mean, change is a never ending journey. And we are, we are walking down that road now and addressing this, these issues. Um, I think the victim's ability to testify, to face 
you know, his, their accuser or, I mean, their um, assailant or whoever has committed the crime against them is vital. I think it makes them a reality, not just a, a, a number or a case or a testimony. So I think those, these are all positive steps. Um, I think the DA's office is doing an excellent job being reactive to these, these circumstances, but I feel that us as a society need to be more pro proactive and address the issues of the bias crimes the, and the hate crimes that are happening still still to this day so um i appreciate being a victim i am taking the burden of being a victim and making my voice heard so that hopefully things will change i appreciate your time thank you thanks for coming this morning tommy all right thanks. Thank you so much, Tommy. You highlighted a number of things and obviously every decision that's made in consultation with victims and informed by victims perspectives and experience is a better decision and a better outcome. So I appreciate you being here today. Um, we do have one other um, survivor who is joining us. Lindsay, are you available as well? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much. I will um, turn this over to you to share your experience. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners and chair. My name is Lindsay Duncan and I'm a recent survivor of criminal domestic violence that occurred in District 2 of Multnomah County. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today and thank you to District Attorney Mike Schmidt for recognizing the reform that is so needed. Being involved in a domestic violence case is time and labor intensive, emotional and downright confusing. My responding police officer gave me a handout with resources for victims of domestic violence. I was assigned an advocate with the Portland Police Bureau. I had an advocate, advocate from the DA's office who helped me understand what was going on as I had never been involved in the court system before. She connected me with the Oregon Crime Victims Law Center where I received legal assistance for myself. Despite all the resources, it was all very overwhelming and my rights were so unclear. I am educated and intelligent, yet I was confused every step of the way. I'm not afraid to ask questions, but sometimes I didn't even know what questions to ask because I didn't know what I didn't know. Our system is fraught with justice for the criminal and injustice for the victim. Please hear these six injustices to victims that I personally experienced in my case. One, I believe that the victim should have the right to a trial versus the defendant being offered a plea negotiation by default. I was pleased that my case was assigned to a deputy district attorney who was communicative, made himself available to let me ask all the questions that I wanted to, and he made me feel like he genuinely cared about the outcome of my case. But even so, I found myself at odds with him. I just couldn't wrap my brain around a plea negotiation. Why couldn't my case go to trial? It's incredibly unjust and downright disrespectful to me that my abuser is being held accountable to a single crime when he would have been tried on seven. Why does the state want to release a violent criminal out into public with almost negligible jail time and probation requirements anyway? How is that keeping the best interest of the community in mind? Two, the restitution process is completely unfair. There's no way for a victim to know all of the expenses she will incur just weeks after the incident, which is when we're asked to return our restitution request. Also, moving expenses are not eligible for restitution reimbursement because the court finds that no contact orders are sufficient protection. But I would remind the court that if the law prevented inappropriate behavior, we wouldn't be in a court case in the first place. Three, there's no penalty for non-response from the defense by any given deadlines, leaving victims in a constant state of discontent and unease, unable to fully move forward with their lives. I understand that may be specific to COVID times. Um, and number four, 
Victims likely cannot often appear at hearings in their own cases because the system only allows for 24 hours or less notice on when and where to report. I think often about the privilege that I had as I faced my situation. I have a job that's understanding of what I went through and they allowed me the flexibility to take calls with my supporters at any time, to go to the courthouse when needed, to take time off when needed, and to show up here today. Um, all with no threat of me losing my job. And I feel like most people are probably not so lucky. Five, victims can't know when their abusers go to jail, even though we can learn when the abusers are released. And six, victims can't know where their abusers live or work unless the probation officers will tell them, making it difficult to avoid places that the abusers are most likely to be. I appreciate that Multnomah County is focused on rehabilitation for criminals as I believe all humans, including my attacker, are capable of change. However, I also believe that a balance can be struck. We can both hold a criminal accountable for all of their crimes and rehabilitate them. We can treat both the criminal and the victim as humans who need support from their community. In our system, the victim is simply left behind. Three minutes is not nearly enough time to share all that I want to share with you. I encourage you commissioners to read my victim impact statement, which I've provided, and I welcome any follow-up conversation with any of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much. It's a powerful reminder that we do have to continue to challenge ourselves and look at victims' rights and, and meaningful access to those rights to, to work forward. Um, I know that um, we had wanted to share today's proclamation with the board um, in a video form, which would have featured myself, Rhea, Chief Deputy Rhea. District Attorney John Casolino, and District Attorney Mike Schmidt. But we understand that the feature would actually interfere with the live stream. So um, today we are joined by Mike Schmidt, who will be reading our proclamation. I do want to thank both Rhea and um, Deputy DA, or Deputy DA, my apologies, my DA Mike yeah. Schmidt, um, who came up with the idea to make this accessible in video. Thank you so much. I will pass it to you, Mike. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Kafori, members of the board. My name is Mike Schmidt. I'm the district attorney of Multnomah County, and I'm so happy to be here with you today. In the interest of time, I'm going to jump right into the proclamation. Proclaiming the week of April 18th through April 24th, 2021 as National Crime Victims Rights Week in Multnomah County, Oregon. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners finds each year thousands of residents in Multnomah County experience victimization that can result in trauma, pain, humiliation, destabilization, personal and financial losses. Crime impacts each person uniquely. It can change the way a person sees themselves as well as how they see the world around them. It can shatter a person's sense of safety and negative consequences can ripple out into every area of their life. These impacts are felt not only by the person directly harmed by those closest to them through families, friendships, and entire communities. This week elevates the importance of crime victims' rights and their critical role in providing crime victims and survivors ways to meaningfully participate in the criminal justice process. Crimes can leave a lasting impact on any person, regardless of age, national origin, race, creed, religion, gender, sexual orientation, immigration, or economic status. Serving victims, honoring their rights, and being responsive to their diverse needs restores hope to survivors and supports healthy and thriving communities. The Multnomah County District Attorney's Office and the Multnomah County Department of Community Justice renew our commitment to preventing violence before it begins. On this week, we recognize and honor the dedicated efforts that Multnomah County takes every day to promote the physical, emotional, and developmental health of children, teens, adults, families, and our entire community. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners proclaims the week of April 18th through April 24th, 2021 to be National Crime Victims Rights Week in Multnomah County, Oregon, and reaffirms this county's commitment to a victim service and criminal justice response that treats all crime victims and survivors with humanity, 
respect, and compassion is responsive to all their unique needs and honors all of their rights. Adopted this 22nd day of April 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tasia, did we receive any public testimony in this item? No, Madam Chair, we did not. I'm going to um, call on commissioners by district to see if who has questions or comments. And we will start with Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. I'm ready. Um, I I just want to thank, first of all, um, DA Schmidt and Rhea and um, for bringing this forward and Emily for bringing this forward and for all the work you do every day um, in the district attorney's office um, as you're seeking justice and, and um, prosecuting cases um, of, of centering um, victims and the impacts on them and their and their families. Um, you know, as they're as they're part of the process as well. And I especially wanted to thank um, Rochelle and Tommy and Lindsay. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us today, for making yourself vulnerable um, by letting us see a glimpse of what your experience has been. It's really important for us to hear those stories. Um, and I think it honors what this week means and the work that's happening to create a justice system that is more trauma informed, that um, is, um, Putting into practice restorative justice um, practices, and um, that's really uh, making sure that we're we're doing what we need to to communicate and empower um, victims in the process as well. So I, I just appreciate all of that, and um, you know, and all, each of your stories I think was um, provided a glimpse into what's happening today and what people are experiencing, whether it was the race-based assault. Um, that Tommy experienced, or some of the um, or some of the um, ongoing um, abuse that that people experienced, um, all of these, you know, all of these things, and so much more, comes into our our justice system. And to be have um, have a focus on what's needed to protect the um, the rights of victims and to respond and, and for the for the emotional and social needs of victims as well. Um, Lindsay, I especially appreciate some of the concrete you think you things you talked about in terms of things that we can work on. So um, I think it's this is not such an important proclamation and just really appreciate the work that's happening and the work that we're dedicated to um, to growing and continuing for victims. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, D.A. Schmidt and Rhea and Emily for bringing forth this proclamation. Uh, it, it was really eye-opening um, and really to talk about the right to be safe and how so many uh, do not feel safe. And I really appreciate Rochelle and Tommy and Lindsay. Uh, I mean, all of those things that you outlined about how victims have so few rights uh, clearly outlines the work that lies ahead of us. Uh, and I think what all of you, what, what was so remarkable about each one of you, even though you were a victim of a crime, you all talked about restorative justice. It wasn't just about punishing somebody, but it was about holding somebody accountable. But more importantly, it was about rehabilitating them so that they couldn't cause further harm to somewhere, someone else. And Tommy, I really appreciate you uh, having the courage to press charges. There is so much anti-Asian hate right now, and I, I feel your pain. Um, it's a scarier world today for me and for many of my AAPI brothers and sisters. Uh, and we know that um, African-Americans and Blacks have experienced this for hundreds of years. Uh, but I, I've just found this, this presentation and proclamation so important to hear from a victim's perspective. We don't often hear this and we need to know what is lacking in our system if we're ever really gonna truly address it. So thank you all for sharing your personal experiences. I just want you to know that it was extremely meaningful to me. Thank you. Commissioner Myron. So, um, 
I too, I want to thank you, um, Rhea and Emily for all the work that you do and for this presentation here today and also DA Schmidt for the work you're doing um, to really transform our system of, of, of criminal justice and for reading the proclamation. Um, and then a very special thank you and um, my deep gratitude to Rochelle and Tommy and Lindsay for sharing your personal experiences, um, for really making it real and and for that the courage it takes to come and speak here today. Um, it, this was such a powerful presentation and grounds us so much in the profound needs of our community and for people who are the victim of crimes as we work to reimagine our systems of criminal justice and public safety. Um, to me, a lot of what I heard uh, harkens back to the What Works in Public Safety conference that we, um, I think we all attended in the, the early days of last year when we, we could gather in person and have those kinds of experiences. And the focus there was visioning of around how important it was to support victims in terms of an overarching public safety, um, community justice, criminal justice strategy. Um, I, I just vividly recall uh, some of the presentations there and emphasis on how how so often there's this kind of tension in our current systems between, you know, victim and offender and and that leads to separate responses. And uh, there was a consideration of how our justice systems could collaborate on um, on a really holistic and healing approach to increasing public safety. Helping victims of crime is essential to our public safety strategy, and um, we heard today so many common themes of what we need is a public safety system that offers a pathway to accountability um, for harm, what we heard today, uh, support for healing, as we heard today, and a process, really importantly, for restorative justice. Um, there is a lot of important work being done, and uh, I I appreciate that tie-in um, from all of the uh, the presenters here today, and um, those those themes that are so important. Um, I also want to emphasize the tie-in of this work to um, our work in dismantling um, systemic racism and point to uh, a really brilliant um, uh, publication called When We Tell Our Stories. Uh, this was a report coordinated by Partnership for Safety and Justice with a number of our community partners, um, and particularly with our BIPOC community, so Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, um, really raising the issue that there is particularly scant attention paid to survivors of color in in a lot of our communities where needs are particularly profound and there are even more addition more stressors and those needs are not elevated so um really uh the work that's ongoing to ensure all victims uh, and survivors needs are met and really um pointing to victims of color in um, in that work as well. I think it's appropriate today with the launching of the cha the chair's proposed budget and elevating the need for transforming our systems of public safety and criminal justice and prevention and addressing violence in our communities that that we have the proclamation on this on this very day. Um, so thank you all again today for the presentation and your powerful testimony. I think my commissioners have all said it so eloquently. I will only add my thanks and gratitude um, to the staff, to the DA and the staff in your office, um, but especially to community members who came and shared their very personal um, stories with us this morning. And um, not just 
tales of of sorrow, but tales of hope and um, and suggestions on how to make things better. Um, we appreciate you all. Thank you um, again for coming this morning. And uh, with that, Tasia, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. And Chair Kavori. Aye. The proclamation is adopted. Thank you, everyone. R7, resolution approving the Southeast Health Center structural repairs, FAC 1 project construction plan. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R7. Dan, is this you up? Or Adrian? Yes. Oh, good morning. Good morning, Chair Kafori and commissioners. Uh, Tasia, would you mind uh, loading up the presentation for us? Thank you, Tasia. Uh, good morning. My name is Dan Zalko. I'm the division director for facilities and property management. I am joined today for this presentation by Tony, also from facilities, and Adrian and Ryan from Integrated Clinical Services, each of whom will introduce themselves when they present their portions of the presentation. Uh, we are here to share with you an update on the Southeast Health Center building project and to seek approval to proceed with construction. Uh, next slide, please. Today's presentation will include a bit about the project's history, the reason it is needed, its scope, impact on patient care, staff relocation, and the status, schedule, and budget of the project. And next slide, please. The center is off Southeast 34th Avenue, just south of Powell Boulevard. The county purchased the property in 1982 when it was about 15 years old and then added a wing in 1989. Uh, next slide, please. Last May, you all approved us moving ahead with planning and design work with $880,000 being allocated to the project. At the time, the project was estimated to be between 3.7 and $4 million. The planning and design work is now complete, and we estimate the project to be able to be completed for about $3.3 million. Uh, next slide, please. I will now uh, turn it over to Tony. Go ahead, Tony. Good morning. My name is Tony Weiner. I am the strategic project manager who is providing the pre-construction and construction project management for this project. And I use the she, her pronoun. Um, overall statement of need, the Southeast Health Center structural repair will replace the structural blue lamb beams damaged from years of water infiltration through the failed EFIS exterior siding. To maintain occupancy over the past few years, the beams have been temporarily shored and inspected by our operation and maintenance staff monthly and a licensed structural engineer quarterly, maintaining patient and staff safety throughout this entire period until we can fully complete the building repair. Next slide, please. Okay. Project scope. The exterior project scope for the Southeast Health Center structural repairs includes the replacement of the deteriorated blue lamb beams, the failed EFIS siding, which caused the deterioration, and with an improved durable siding system and new energy efficient windows. Um, to accomplish the structural repairs, we'll need to relocate patient services completely out of the West Wing during construction to other facilities within the county. In preparation for this work, the project includes the build out of the last two dental operatories in the North Portland Dental Clinic to provide additional patient services and reduce revenue loss during construction. The West Wing's existing flooring system is no longer consistent with modern healthcare flooring standards. While clinical services are relocated, this is the optimal time to replace the flooring, eliminating construction inconveniences to staff and patients and substantially reducing 
the cost of this building upgrade. Uh, the Southeast Health Center primary care clinic presently has only one respiratory isolation exam room that over the last year has proved to be insufficient for the number of suspected respiratory infectious patients that the clinic serves. Two existing exam rooms will be renovated during construction shutdown to provide this additional respiratory protection to staff and patients. Next slide, please. The two arrows you see show the location of the glue lamb beams to be replaced that are located under the west wing along the north and south exterior walls and are accessible through the lower level parking garage located under the west wing. So these are the glue lambs that cause the situation that brings on the um, entire project. Thank you, and I'm going to hand this over to Adrian now from ICS. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Adrian Daniel, and I am the deputy director of the Community Health Center program. Next slide, please. The Southeast Health Center is one of our seven main primary care centers of our federally qualified health center program. There's a very diverse patient population, with more than 40% preferring to speak a language other than English at home, and more than half of our patients identify as a race or ethnicity other than white. It's also a central resource for low-income community members, um, especially those who experience homelessness. Finally, our pharmacy program based at the Southeast Health Center serves a wide variety of patients other than just those located in the Southeast region. For example, it serves as the central hub for all pharmacy delivery services and packaging for student health center patient population. Next slide, please. During this project, uh, we will see major impacts across our three main service lines. Of note, the pharmacy program will remain open during construction, so we hope to maintain high levels of patient access to critical medications and clinical pharmacy treatments on site. However, the primary care and dental programs will have to temporarily relocate to other existing health center locations during the construction uh, process. We've included uh, key operational changes to assure that staff and patients understand their different care options during this time. And I've invited our project manager, Ryan Francario, to talk more about this in detail with us. Good morning, I'm Ryan Francario, Integrated Clinical Services Project Manager and ICS Project Manager Lead for the Southeast Health Center Repair Project. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'll begin by providing you with, oh, next slide, please. Thank you. I'll begin by providing you with an overview of our internal planning process and strategy to ensure that our relocation plans for patients, providers, and staff are patient-led, staff-informed, and trauma-informed. The key aim for our patient and staff relocation plans is to provide equitable and continuous support through all phases of relocation and staff transition and service transition. Our clinical and operations staff designed and implemented a multiple language representative patient survey to assess community and patient needs, preferences, and impact to, to develop a service transition plan that was reflexive to meet them and reduce barriers to our health and dental care services. Using this feedback, ICS is implementing a multi-format patient communication plan, which will use mail letters, emails, lobby materials, pharmacy bag inserts, texts, my chart messages, our patient access center, and social media posts in the top five patient group languages. This plan is designed to provide information accessibility and a smooth transition for patients among clinic sites with an emphasis on supporting our BIPOC patient communities. We continue to work collaboratively with the Community Health Center Board, which is updated on any changes to SEHC, SEHC service levels and provides valuable insight into patient and community perspective. Finally, ICS operations, leadership, and pharmacy, dental, primary care, and infection prevention work groups have convened to lead the SEHC repair project work plan and inform the integration of this project work into all aspects of the SEHC care delivery. Next slide, please. 
SCHC primary care patients and staff will be proportionally relocated to Mid-County, East County, and Rockwood clinics based on patient preference, need, site capacity, and patient residence distribution. Southeast Health Center Dental Clinic services will relocate to the new North Portland Dental Clinic site, as well as East County and Mid-County sites, offer telehealth visits, and flexible patient scheduling for preferred clinic sites. Southeast Health Center Pharmacy Services will remain open, maintaining current operating schedule and capacity levels. Due to temporary closure of primary care, patient utilization of the services um, is expected to temporarily drop. Both primary care and dental services will continue to provide expanded virtual health, telehealth, and virtual pre-visit screening services to clients to bridge care during this transition time. Now I'll hand off to Adrian Daniels. Thank you. I'm going to briefly talk further about the timeline um, of this project and the incorporation of key uh, decision points. Next slide, please. Looking at the six uh, month time frame, we are really uh, rapidly approaching the start of the construction uh, period. So as we move into late spring and early summer, uh, we will effectively wrap all early engagement and communication with our patients. Um, as Ryan described, intensive communication and outreach to those specific groups who will see changes in their primary care and dental care options. This is also the time period where we'll begin to transfer staff. Over the summer, we will see the largest amount of construction occur. Um, and then we will also ramp back up communication in the early fall regarding returns to Southeast so patients can remain appraised of those timelines. The goal of this is to return fully in full capacity by January of 2022. Next slide, please. Ryan mentioned several of these key aspects in her presentation, and I would like to highlight their alignment with values of our care for all different um, service areas. For high quality, safe, and meaningful care, this product has paid specific attention to infection prevention, including the OSHA COVID-19 protocols during the repair process, as well as identifying points which we can improve our existing care related to infection prevention, such as the addition of respiratory precaution rooms. The plan has also been informed um, by our community, paying specific attention to how patients prefer to be informed and kept updated on communications and changes in where they would seek services. We've worked with our care teams and staff on an inclusive uh, relocation plan where staff are included in their preferred relocation uh, periods during this process. And finally, remaining fiscally sound and accountable to this repair objective, which included an options appraisal and analysis of what alternative spaces and repair options would provide the best balance of efficiency, patient service levels, and cost to the county. Next slide, please. Our Community Health Council Board has been able to approve these changes and the changes in hours and locations. They will continue to stay updated on this project over the summer. Residents of the county will also potentially see um, additional impacts of this project based off of COVID-19. We've been tracking uh, the impact on Medicaid eligibility closely and will continue to do so as we believe the Southeast Health Center remains a pivotal and key access point for many of our patients. Next slide, please. I believe we'll pass this back over to our facilities partners. Hello, this is Tony again. Um, the current status of the project, the, the, the design phase is completed along with all permit reviews by the city of Portland. The competitive bid process is completed and DCA procurement has certified Swinnerton Construction as a general contractor for the project. ICS has completed the relocation communication plans for the transfer of staff and patients to other clinics. Our next step is to execute a contract with the approved low bidder to begin the pre-construction process. Uh, continued to update the community health center on the project status and patient care relo relocation information. We will also move forward with the Regional Arts and Cultural Council and our Green Tech partners for those components of the project, as well as to begin 
the on site construction after the relocation of clinical services to alternate sites within the county. Next slide, please. Our preliminary schedule at this point is we've completed the second procurement as stated and the competitive bid. On or about July 5th through the 12th, we expect all clinical staff to relocate to their alternate clinical locations with construction beginning on site July 14th. We're expecting substantial completion of the project January 10th with clinical full reopening on January 21st, 2022. Thank you. Dan, it's yours now. Thank you, Tony. Next slide, please. Uh, what you'll see here is the breakdown of the budget. It shows the construction budget for the base project of nearly $900,000, the various soft costs, including design, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, project management costs, and important allocations to the Construction Diversity and Equity Fund Program, Green Technology, and for artwork. It also shows additions associated with project delays due to a failed procurement this past winter and the scope additions that Tony described earlier in the presentation. Now, next slide, please. The remaining allocation needed to complete this project is about $2.4 million to reach the new project budget amount of about $3.3 million. This is $400,000 to $700,000 below what was estimated last spring. Next slide, please. This brings us to our request today. The project team is seeking approval of the resolution before you to approve the FAC-1 to proceed with construction and complete the Southeast Health Center structural repair project. Next slide, please. Uh, we will now gladly answer any questions you all have for Adrian, Ryan, Tony, or me, and thank you very much for your consideration of this resolution. Uh, back to you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Tasha, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair, we did not. All right. Questions, comments from commissioners? We'll start with Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, Thanks to all of you for um, your your presentation here today. It was so thorough and um, well presented. Also, with an ex, you know, it, it never hurts to have the estimate revised downward from what it was uh, going to be. Uh, and so, I appreciate that. And um, and also, Tony, I just I can't help but um, just mention aloud how wowed I am by your library in that background. That's, <laughs> you know, we talked about libraries today, but that that is that is quite impressive. So um, it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I, I guess where I just was curious if you're able to speak to where where that the decrease particularly came from. Um, and and I I might have just missed when you when you said that, but how how we're able to revise down that um, substantially, which I again I'm thrilled about. The general contractor Swinnerton Construction, who okay. was low bid, came in much lower than both our architects. Um, budget and our third party budget. We were we were incredibly surprised and happy about it too. I got to tell you. <laughs> Great. Um well well thank you so much. I don't have any other questions. Great job. Commissioner Peggy Peterson. Thank you chair. Um Thank you, Dan and Tony and Adrian and Ryan for this presentation. It was, as um, Commissioner Myron said, it was incredibly thorough and I really appreciate not just getting a really clear sense of what's happening in terms of the facilities um, the, and, the, and the construction project piece, but um, for um, from ICS just to hear really in depth the plan for what was happening to the current clients and staff and all of the thoughtful work that has gone into a communication plan and a relocation plan um, for the different services, I think is so important. Um, so, and, and just really appreciate appreciate being able to see like all of the considerations that you took into account, you know, in putting the plan together. 
um, and I agree, having um, a project like this come in below what our estimate was is pretty surprising. So hopefully that will stay the case as we move through this construction project. But I know that this this project uh, specifically has been a long time coming, and a lot of a lot of planning um, has gone into this. And so I'm just really uh, glad to support this next step as we're able to then move into to actually um, working on this project in the summer. So thank you all for all your work on this. Thank you, everyone. I, I know I speak for everyone. I say, let's go. We're ready. Have this project start and be done with. All right, Tasia, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Baker Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Capori? I just realized, did I skip you, Commissioner Stegman? You did, but my fellow commissioners said everything already. But thank you, Chair. Are you sure? I'm happy to give you a few minutes in the spotlight. Okay. Okay, I respiratory <laughs> isolation room. Not only are you all preserving the future of the building, but seeing that's I'll call that out and appreciate that. Thank you. My apologies. I was just so ready to get going. I've got my tool belt right here. I'm going to go down there and start hammering. All right, I vote aye. And with that, the resolution is adopted. Thanks, everybody. All right. Now we have time for board comments on non agenda items. Commissioner Stegman, why don't you go first? I don't have anything. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Vega Peterson. I do have one thing that I wanted to share, which is that on Monday evening at 5 p.m., I'm going to be, um, I have a panel coming together to talk about the, uh, it's an East Portland gun violence community conversation. Um, we're going to be joined by um, D.A. Schmidt and um, our own Ebony Clark and um, and other folks um, from both Multnomah County um, PPB as well as um, community organizations like Latino Network and POIC. Um, so I'm I'm excited about this because I know I've been hearing from constituents for you know that for months and months now about the impact of gun violence that's um, happening in, in East Portland and thought it was a good time to to bring people together to talk about not just what is happening but what the response is and what's the long-term plans as we're reimagining um, public safety so people can go to that um, by it's tinyurl.com slash east pdx 2021 convo tinyurl.com east pdx 2021 convo if people want to register um, it's also on Facebook. Thank you. And Commissioner Myron. Nothing for me. Thanks. Thank you all for attending our board meeting this morning. Next week, we will be back. It will be budget, 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 and we look forward to having all of your participation. That is our conclusion and there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. See you next week.